Good morning, everyone, and welcome. I'm Carol Johnson. I'm the administrator of the Health Resources and Services Administration. It's really my pleasure to welcome you to the HHS National Telehealth Teleconference uh, this week. And, um, you know, we began this last year with the hope that we could bring together experts to talk about the role that telehealth is playing in ensuring access to healthcare services. And we had such an overwhelming response that we were excited to. Um, check back in again this year and host another conference to be able to really talk about the state of telehealth, what we've learned, um, and where we're going going forward, um, which is why it's really my pleasure to host this first session this morning on leading the way in telehealth with my colleague, Dr. Mina Shashmani. Um, and Dr. Shashmani is a, um, get this right, is a Hopkins trained surgeon an Oxford trained economist um, and a real leader in healthcare policy. She's led healthcare systems um, and she's led healthcare policy for a long time. In fact, I know Mina well from our days um, in the Obama administration when she led the HHS Office of Health Reform and really helped drive healthcare policy when it came to delivery system reform. And so today she's at the, on the forefront of the, another round of healthcare innovation, both in terms you've seen the work she's done over the last several years, but culminating in the last week or two with, re with respect to drug pricing, um, but also when it comes to telehealth. Um, Mina is a terrific partner to us at the Health Resources and Services Administration. In this administration, um, the work that we do with underserved and rural communities is also at the forefront of the work that Mina is doing in Medicare. She is consistently asking how Medicare policy can, can help drive better access for the communities that we serve. And so as we work as a community across um, Health Resources and Services Administration grantees to improve access to health care for people in underserved communities, in rural communities, people with HIV, for moms and kids across the country. And we work to get healthcare providers um, to those communities. Our partnership with Mina and her team at Medicare has been invaluable. So I'm so delighted to be here with you today, Dr. Tashamani. Thank you so much for having me, and I echo the partnership. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Um, so let's just jump right in and talk a little bit about, I think we can talk about policy in a minute, but maybe we could just start with, I mean, you're a practicing clinician and you have been for a long time. You've seen the um, transition that's happened as, as telehealth has come into play. And if you could just talk a little bit about um, what your priorities at CMS are with respect to telehealth and how you see that impacting patients. Absolutely, and I'll start you know, with you know, where you started of my own experience as a physician. I was practicing medicine when the pandemic hit and I was leading care transformation for a major health system. And the ability to be able to use telehealth to really meet patients where they are is something that was critical for us during the pandemic so that we could make sure that, for example, we were doing outreach to people in communities to make sure that they were staying healthy during the pandemic, helping them with isolation precautions, et cetera. But also the lessons learned for that to, for example, when we were caring for our diabetics, we found that being able to do you know, remote physiologic monitoring and making a phone call to check in on them was a way to stay in touch with them where they didn't then have to take three buses to get to our clinic. And you know, that personal experience um, is something that I definitely bring into my role now in Medicare where we wanna see where delivery innovations like telehealth can improve access to care, address disparities that exist in you know, being able to access and utilize care and where that innovation can keep people healthy so that better care is being provided and we're keeping people healthy in their communities, out of the hospital, et cetera. So a lot of the work that, that we are doing is really towards that goal that is an overall vision for um, the Medicare program that I'm sure we can you know, talk more about too. Yeah, it's such a great point. You know, um, what we have seen with the communities that we serve is um, solving in some ways for the problem that you point out, which is the, you know, you have to get childcare for your fa for your kids. You have to take three buses to get to a doctor's appointment. You have to do find time in your day to be able to do the follow up. You might miss work to be able um, and and not get paid for that time to be able to get to a visit. And so, what what access means for people. Um, can really differ and really matters when it comes to um, thinking creatively about new tools going forward. 
Yeah, absolutely. Do you want to talk a little bit about how at Medicare you're thinking about telehealth and what um, what the lessons learned have been from the last several years? Yeah, and I will say that we are still learning lessons from the last several years, and I would say that this is a time, a call to action for all of us to really see with the changes that have occurred through the pandemic and that are continuing, what's working, what isn't, being able to have data to help guide where policy making could go. So, you know, one thing to keep in mind with the Medicare program is that there is Medicare law, maybe at the 50,000 foot level that basically guides what the Medicare program can and cannot do. Within the authorities that we are provided with the law, then we do regulations, which is at about the 25,000 foot level to say, okay, here is how you know, payments will be made, care can be provided, you know, standards that we set. And then you have care on the ground and how that actually plays out. And I think it's really important to remember all three of those levels come together to create the Medicare program. So, you know, telehealth is a good example where where we have the authorities in the law, then we can enact the regulations. So recently, Congress gave us the authority to make telehealth payments and behavioral health permanent for, you know, after the pandemic, you know, public health emergency were to end. And we acted upon that and we made telehealth permanent for behavioral health. So it is in place now where we will pay for telehealth services, including audio only, which is important, particularly in rural areas that have, you know, um, uh, band, uh, bandwidth issues with internet. Um, so we made that permanent. We also provide those payments for FQHCs and rural health clinics. And also with an eye towards where can these services really be helpful, we also enabled hospital staff to get paid if they provide telehealth, behavioral health services to patients in their homes. So a patient doesn't need to be in the hospital to be able to get that telehealth service because we know, especially in rural areas, a lot of times the healthcare providers work in that critical access hospital, you know, our rural soul community hospital. And we know that access is a huge issue with behavioral health. So where are the levers that we have in the Medicare program to be able to enable that access to care and where can we leverage telehealth? And beyond behavioral health, Congress has provided um, the ability for us to pay for telehealth um, broadly through 2024. So we have also made that happen where telehealth will be provided through the end of 2024. This is specifically important for areas that are not right now in Medicare law. For example, when a patient is in their house for them to be able to get telehealth services or patients who are not in rural areas. So over the next period of time, it will be important for all of us to look at how that care is being utilized. Is it safe? Is it high quality? Is it driving better care? So that that, that can be part of further conversations for you know after 2024. Yeah, it's really exciting. And you said a lot there. So maybe we can yeah. just unpack it a little. One of the reasons I think you're emphasizing that the patient can be at home is because in the past we used to have this sort of site of service rule. That's right. Right. Can you just talk a little bit about how it used to work and what yes. how sort of dramatic this change is? Yes, so in Medicare law, telehealth can be provided when a patient is in certain sites. Like you could have a patient in a clinic and they are doing a telehealth visit with a healthcare provider who's in another clinic. There is not the opportunity in standard Medicare law for the patient to have their site be their house. So that was a waiver that was created through the public health emergency that has been extended to the end of 2024. And the rural one is another important one where traditionally in Medicare law, telehealth can be paid when the provider is in a rural area. But I think as we have all learned, the example that I gave you is in an urban area in Washington, DC. And so are there opportunities to rethink um, about you know, what those sites are? And again, some of this is done through our regulation. Some of this is done through Congress, but I'm spe just speaking more broadly about the conversation that all of us you know, should engage in to your point about what our lessons learned from yeah, the pandemic. I think that's such a great point. I think um, I may be oversimplifying it, but um, it feels to me in some ways like what we've learned is we kind of had a telehealth system to the extent we had one that was built around 
helping providers get patients connected to other providers, like from their clinic to another provider. And now we're, well, it's a little more patient centric, like where is the patient? Can we really wrap around that patient and get them access to care from whatever site um, they are in? Yeah, and to your, to your point about being patient centric, we're also thinking about, can we move beyond the more traditional ways that healthcare has been viewed? where a healthcare clinician is a physician, where it is just in an office visit that has this ENM code, right? And this ICD-10 diagnosis, can we think about more team-based approaches to care? So for example, we're proposing in behavioral health that licensed marriage and family therapists, um, licensed clinical counselors, they can bill Medicare um, for behavioral health services, where we can provide payments when a social worker or a clinical psychologist provides behavioral health services during a primary care office visit. So we're really trying to think about all the ways that we can think we can provide care more holistically, really encourage that. And that's where it's so important to get feedback from your team and from your grantees who are, again, on that ground zero, caring for people on the ground to see where are the barriers right now? Where are the hindrances to the kinds of care that people want to be able to provide? And then what can we do to further support that? I think you can't hear it, but there are a lot of people applauding now in the audience <laughs> um, because what has happened in community health centers in Ryan White HIV clinics and rural clinics across the country um, for years is to try to build team based care um, and to work within the existing rules to be able to do that. Um, and as you pointed out, you know, I like to say that these are the settings where social determinants of work happened um, before we had a name for it, mm -hmm. you know, where we're really building that community based workforce. We're investing in training and, and um, building the community health worker, community doulas, peer support professionals. And as you all are thinking about it, I know this is sort of of a piece with the Biden Harris administration goal of really thinking holistically about how to meet people where they are and get them healthcare services where they are. So thank you for your leadership on this. Oh, I mean, and thank you. It's a very exciting time, you know, where we are able to propose, you mentioned community health we're proposing to pay for community health services, which is the first time in a Medicare payment system, again, to think outside of the box a little bit to what really can help people to stay healthy. And that has to be done, to come back full circle to how you started our conversation, that has to be done in partnership with HRSA, with all of the providers that you work with so that we can make sure, A, that if we finalize this payment that people know about it and are able to utilize it, and so that we can support the workforce, right? So that you have the people to, to be able to do that work. And it's a huge opportunity to lift up communities, to have people from those very communities get these kinds of jobs that they can then in turn support their communities and they can do it better than you know anybody else. So I think it's a really exciting time for us collectively in healthcare to really drive change in the system. I think that's so <clears throat> right. And thinking about coupling the community health workforce with telehealth policy um, as we think about this going forward, how all of that is extenders of how we get more access points um, for people across the community. Mm -hmm. But I just wanted to circle back for a second so mm -hmm. we don't um, miss the opportunity to really talk about how how um, comprehensive the approach you've taken on behavioral health is. Um, you. Congress gave you direction, but you all took it and made sure very quickly um, that telehealth policy was made permanent um, for behavioral health. And it's making a real difference in communities across the country, not just because you all have done it, but because you all recognize the leader that you are in setting policy that you know many private payers, many Medicaid plans follow your lead. On yes, absolutely. I mean, Medicare is the largest payer in the country. We pay almost a trillion dollars in claims each year. We partner with more than a million clinicians, more than 6,000 hospitals. So to your point, when Medicare makes a policy, everybody is watching and seeing it. And I think we also have a huge opportunity as a convener, as a facilitator, to bring people together to say, okay, what are some best practices? Because again, this is an area of innovation. What are things that people can learn from it? To your point of how can team-based approaches to care utilize some of these innovations in the most effective way where we're looking to provide better care 
to improve the health of people and to spend money in a smarter way. And so I think for all of those reasons, it, it really is a unique opportunity, you know, for us in the Medicare program. Yeah, and it's really been exciting to see how it's all come together. And and so let's talk a little bit about where we go from here. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that Congress extended other telehealth policy through 2024. I think, um, and you and I have talked about, and I think um, uh, the community well knows that there's a lot of work to happen um, between now and then to really understand what's working, um, where the challenges are, where the gaps are, and maybe where uh, to help provide some input to the direction going forward. So can you just talk a little bit about how you and the Medicare team are thinking about those inputs and how to gather those inputs going forward? Absolutely. So I think, you know, where we can um, engage, for example, we have our accountable care organization learning community. Just as an example, where we bring healthcare providers together who are engaging in more team-based approaches to care through one of our programs it's called the Medicare Shared Savings Program, to hear from them, how are things going? What's working, what isn't? Um, I think there are avenues like that. You know, partnering with you, when you bring together the rural health clinics, the FQHCs, and this is important in a few ways. Number one, you know, we've talked a little bit about data and just to, you know, emphasize there, where it's really important for us to be, to be analyzing how care is being utilized, what impact it is having, on both, you know, healthcare costs, you access and utilization, health outcomes moving forward. I think the other piece of it is where are there barriers to utilizing this? So to come back to something that you mentioned, Carol, about community health, we all know that electronic health records were very much focused on, you know, claims and billing in a traditional healthcare environment, and being able to get ideas in that we can work in partnership with our colleagues at you know, the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT of how, for example, those technologies can be utilized. How can telehealth better be utilized? Where are the barriers right now so that there can be work on that end as well? So you are both looking at what's working, what isn't on the outcome side, but also on the input side, are the people who need to be able to access able to? And a prime example of this is we did, um, HHS did a report looking at telehealth utilization during the pandemic among people with Medicare and found that black and rural people with Medicare were less likely to use telehealth than their white and urban counterparts. So it's important for us to be diving into why is that the case? Are there some access issues going on where you know telehealth is not being utilized and could that actually exacerbate some of these disparities when in fact i think we all see the promise that telehealth can have in addressing disparities and being able to get feedback on the ground of where those barriers are is also very important for us i think it's such a good point one it's why the biden harris administration is so committed to broadband access right? exactly well unless we actually have the infrastructure um, that that healthcare systems can lean on, then we're not going to be able to deliver it. Two, you made the really important point about audio only. Um, that has mattered so much to our community. It has made a huge difference um, for people who have limited resources and therefore don't have the data plans that could support the the, the rest. But three, I wanted to just emphasize, and I think you um, uh, have hit on this as well. This is not a one for one replacement. Correct. There are, there are people who need to be physically present for certain types of visits. Um, I had a psychologist tell me a story about a patient she was seeing through telehealth and um, on one of their check in visits, he was hesitant to turn on his camera. He was in bed with the um, blankets over it. Like it was clear to her that she needed to see him. Um, and so how we think about healthcare quality um, as we move forward in this direction too, because we are all about access and we are all committed to this pathway going forward, but we wanna make sure that we get the best possible quality of care for people. That, that's right. And um, I'll pick up on two of the points that you mentioned. First, you know, as I was doing telehealth, as an you know, ear, nose and throat doctor during the pandemic, I would joke with my patients, I haven't yet figured out how to remove your earwax through the computer screen. <laughs> Though I could demonstrate, you know, this is how you flush your ear. So being able to figure out when in person, when virtual um, to, for, for quality. The other point of it's not necessarily, you know, a one-to-one -one replacement. 
we have an opportunity to not just replicate a siloed right. fee for service way of providing healthcare, but just providing it over a computer. We have the opportunity to actually address the fact that people are people. They have a myriad of experiences and settings in which their healthcare is being impacted. And telehealth can have that ability to connect those dots. So it's not just a, well, let's do a siloed visit on a computer screen instead of in person. It's how can we utilize this to meet people where they are, to try to address some of the gaps you know, that currently exist in care. And I think that's really where we want innovation to go. Because then if you can do that and you can keep someone healthy and you can keep them out of the hospital, you can address needs between office visits so that they remain healthier. I think that's where we all want to get to in terms of the innovation that we want for, you know, people in our country. That's such an exciting opportunity. And I know you've been a leader on delivery system reform for years and have worked with the Center for Medicare Innovation to think about these pathways going forward. Are there things, are there advice or, or recommendations you would share with the community about ways um, to make sure, to take advantage of the opportunities here to think about um, new models of care? Absolutely. So in the um, Medicare program, in the Center for Medicare, we have the largest accountable care organization program in the country, the Medicare Shared Savings Program, where more than 10 million people with Medicare, more than 500,000 clinicians, where clinicians come together and say, okay, we're gonna provide team-based care and we will be held accountable for the quality of that care and for cost. Because if you are caring for people and keeping them healthy, hopefully you're keeping them out of the hospital, you're keeping them out of the you know, emergency room, you're addressing, preventing medical errors, right? Duplicated tests, you know, uh, medical medication um, errors. So, you know, through that program, we're really looking to grow, especially in rural and underserved areas. So for example, we created a new, pro new part of this program, advanced incentive payments, where for smaller providers in rural and underserved areas, we will provide upfront money to invest in healthcare technology, in telehealth, in these, you know, building these teams. So then providers can become an accountable care organization. And then if they save money to the Medicare program, you know, basically we give a loan of that upfront, you know, savings because it's a good investment because we know that these are some of the most, these are some, these providers are some of the most successful in our programs <clears throat> where they're addressing the needs of their community, keeping them healthy. And so I think that's a really great opportunity for clinicians that you work with where, you know, they can utilize telehealth to be able to keep people healthy and they will share in those savings when they keep people healthy, they improve on quality, they keep people out of the hospital, and where we are providing some, you know, upfront money to help support that transition and all of the assistance that comes with it, as I mentioned, like the ACO learning community, things like that. So that's one example of programs that we have where providers can really leverage telehealth but not feel like they they have to figure everything out themselves. Yeah, I mean, this is why we're all so lucky that you said yes when the president asked you to take this job because <laughs> this is, you know, this has been the longstanding problem for so many folks in our community. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> is the upfront cost um, and the maintenance cost of, of being able to do the kind of innovations that we're talking about here today. Um, and so you all took that on um, robustly and came back with this plan to do upfront costs um, as a way to help providers who have historically not had the opportunity to participate in shared savings programs be part of that program. So it's just really exciting and we're really looking forward to um, uh, the opportunities here. Yeah, and to the point you made earlier, Carol, about how FQHCs and rural health clinics were doing the work in social determinants of health before there was a term for it. That's where we want to leverage that expertise and experience across the country, right? I mean, we can put money out there, but how does that money get used? And how do you support people so that you can actually provide the kind of care that's needed? And your grantees, your communities have a depth of expertise and experience that I think can really support others. Um, on the journey as well, and the work that you all do in lifting up the workforce too, so that we can have the people 
um, the community health workers, the social workers, the psychologists, the case managers, so that you can actually do the work that we want to be able to, you know, provide the, the payments and the support for. So it really is a true partnership because otherwise those three layers I mentioned, if they're not working together, then the patient gets lost in the middle. You know, the person gets lost in the middle. It's so true. And the infrastructure and just thinking holistically about how that infrastructure, that infrastructure is both technology and people mm -hmm. and process and support. Um, and our grant dollars can complement your payment system um, strategies in ways that can really um, bring this all together. Yeah. So um, as our time sort of nears to an end, I just want to make sure um, that folks are thinking about ways to be helpful to you as you all are doing the policy work around the extension um, and what might come next. And so if you have any uh, thoughts or comments on how best to be engaged in that, and I think we are committed to working together um, to make sure that the voices of the communities we serve are heard in that, but even just parameters for how you're thinking about that work. Absolutely, so we've mentioned quite a few things that are right now out for comment. Um, particularly in our outpatient prospective payment system rule and our physician fee schedule. The comment period closes on September 11th, so act fast, mm -hmm. but that is absolutely an area uh, to provide input and give comment. And also, I think, you know, where I've been joining you with meetings that you're having to be able to get feedback. We also in Medicare have an open door if people have ideas definitely set up meetings with us give us your suggestions give us your ideas on paper that we can you know look at many of the things that i have mentioned are ideas that we have gotten from the community so we absolutely want to continue hearing about it and being able to engage in collecting data and analytics on how telehealth is being utilized so that we have that to guide us as we move forward in policy making together I think that's such an important point. The data collection piece um, uh, will help tell the story of mm -hmm. what we've all seen in person, in, in real life, of the work that, as you pointed out, you did yourself as a clinician mm -hmm. and you do now as a policymaker. Um, so I can't thank you enough for your time and your leadership and your really helping to drive comprehensive Medicare policy, but for the purposes of our conversation today, the telehealth leadership that you've brought to the table to help serve the communities that we're trying to reach, um, as well as the broader Medicare population. And so I'm so delighted to have had the chance to talk with you today. Well, and thank you for your leadership and your partnership. I couldn't have asked for a better you know, partner in crime here to be able to drive you know, these much needed changes and improvements for, you know, for the communities that we serve. Terrific. Well, thank you to Dr. Sheshamani and um, many thanks to everyone from in our Office of Telehealth who planned today's meeting. And we know that you'll have um, terrific sessions throughout the day with a number of key stakeholders. And we look forward to your feedback and input as this policy process moves forward.